There's been talk for months now of when the Ukrainian counteroffensive will start. Whether it's already begun, where it'll take place, what forces Ukraine will need to punch through the Russian defenses, whether they have enough tanks and artillery to last for the entire offensive, and whether the offensive will ultimately be successful. Part of the reason there's so much speculation is because the Ukrainian government and its military have taken extraordinary measures to keep their plans and their military disposition quiet, so as to not tip off the Russians as to their plans and avenues of attack. One of the problems with the impending offensive is the high expectation of success that many observers have. Last September's stunningly successful drives east of Kherson and south into Kharkiv took so much ground so quickly that many people expect the same lightning-fast results for the upcoming offensive. But this time, the Russians have been preparing their defenses for more than six months. They've brought in many more troops and artillery and are supported by better trained and equipped support forces. Some military analysts in the West doubt that Ukraine can retake all their occupied terrain before the wet weather of fall and winter sets in. But those doubts have persisted around Ukraine's mere ability to defend themselves against the Russian invasion since the opening stages of the invasion. Three months into the war, historians Liana Fix and Michael Kimmage argued that a full-scale Ukrainian military defeat of Russia, including the retaking of Crimea, verges on fantasy. Thankfully, they and most other Western analysts were wrong about the will of the Ukrainian population to resist Russian occupation and overlooked both the amount of support NATO and the US would provide as well as overestimating the strength and coordination of the Russian invaders. But as Ukraine's counteroffensive begins to take shape, there are still quite a few questions that remain to be answered. The first, oddly enough, is whether the counteroffensive has actually begun. The three conditions for the counteroffensive to begin. Russian President Vladimir Putin has no doubts. He stated publicly on June 9th that he believed the offensive had begun in earnest. Other commentators pointed to June 4th as the date when the Ukrainian forces began their attacks in earnest which explains why two days later, Russian forces blew up the Kakovka Dam on the Dnipro River in order to widen the river downstream. That in turn would allow Russia to pull troops from that region and reinforce other areas where the attacks were more likely to occur. Many analysts had been watching for certain key requirements to determine whether Ukraine felt comfortable enough to launch their major counterattacks. Retired U.S. Lieutenant General Ben Hodges wrote in an article for the Center for European Policy Analysis, or SEPA, on June 11, when we see two or three Ukrainian brigades around 500 to 750 armored vehicles focused on a narrow front, it will be then possible to say that the main attack has probably started and where it's happening. Until then, Hodges said, what we're seeing are initial probing efforts by Ukraine with minimal forces. A few tanks here, a dozen or less IFEs like the US Bradley over there, rather than the full brunt of a major attack. The Ukrainian military commander-in-chief, General Valery Zalushny, has been hailed as a hero for coordinating the defense of Kyiv in the early days of the war. Since then, he's been tasked with coordinating all of Ukraine's military forces and is the man who will make the decision on when and where to commit Ukraine's strategic reserves for any successful attack. General Hodges in his June 11th article said there were likely three overall preconditions that would need to be met before Zaluzhny would give the green light. Has Ukraine gathered enough combat brigades, primarily armored brigades, with sufficient numbers of tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, supported by engineers, artillery, and air defense units, along with the extensive logistical support to keep them all functioning? Will these forces be able to punch through multiple lines of defense that Russia has built throughout eastern Ukraine? Will they have enough strength to achieve the majority of their goals against the occupying Russian forces? These goals will most likely include cutting off Russian connections to the Crimean Peninsula, while also securing significant cities such as Mariupol and Melitopol, while securing Zaporizhia nuclear power station, the largest nuclear station in all of Europe. Would the Russian defenses and logistics stockpiles have been sufficiently degraded? This would include attacking Russian rear areas where artillery and fuel have been stockpiled while also attacking bridges and transportation nodes throughout the occupied portion of Ukraine. From such attacks, Ukraine would hope to confuse the Russian command and control structure about the direction and coordination of the Ukrainian offensive, while also degrading their ability to respond with adequate reinforcements and supplies. And lastly, would the ground be dry enough to support the movement of hundreds of heavy tracked armored vehicles as well as their less mobile wheeled supply transports? While currently the ground is sufficiently dry and firm enough for cross-country travel, this has not been the case for most of the spring all the way through mid-May. Where will Ukraine strike? Retired U.S. Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, who's seen combat in Bosnia, Kosovo, and Iraq, spoke with the Wall Street Journal on May 23rd. He suggested that Ukraine had four likely avenues of attack. 
First, from the region of Kherson in the northwest corner of occupied territories due east to the Sea of Azov, cutting off the Crimean Peninsula. However, the recent destruction of the Novokakovka Dam has made crossing that section of the Dnipro River south of Kherson much more difficult, at least for the time being. That leaves three other main axes of advance. His second choice was the western region of Zaporizhia Oblast, south toward the rail hub of Tokmak, and then further south to the port of Berdyansk on the Sea of Azov. Kimmet pointed out there are good roads through this area, making advances in both wheeled and tracked vehicles easier. But as Ukraine discovered with their initial probing attacks in the region, the roads are heavily mined, as is the ground on both sides. Russian artillery units also have these areas sighted in, so their artillery fire is more accurate than normal Russian counter-artillery. But the terrain is mostly flat ground all the way south, so it's good terrain for highly maneuverable tracked units. Kimmet's third choice is in the Donetsk Oblast south and southeast toward Mariupol. Losing that city early in the war was a significant defeat for the Ukrainians, and retaking it would be an equally significant defeat for Russia. Though the city itself has almost no inhabitable buildings still standing, it does still have port facilities, which would still be useful to Russian resupply efforts. The port needs to be captured or otherwise denied to the Russians. His fourth option would be for Ukraine to attack due east from the Kharkiv area toward Luhansk near the Russian border. Such an offensive would send a clear message to the Russian people that Ukraine's forces are strong enough to force Russian troops back onto their own soil. If Ukraine was able to close off this section of the border, it would do as much to deny the logistical support to the remaining Russian occupation as capturing Crimea and all the ports on the Sea of Azov put together. A closer look at the terrain ahead. The eastern region of Zaporizhia has two parallel defensive lines running west to east, while the western half of the region has three lines. Each of these lines is separated by a distance of 8 to 10 miles from the one south of it. Russian strategy is to abandon the first line when they're about to be overrun and retreat, or as the Russian general staff calls it, redeploying in force to the next line. These defensive lines include extensive trench networks, reinforced strong points, dug-in tanks, machine gun and mortar emplacements, all backed up by more distant artillery units, and the ability to call in helicopter gunships and ground attack fighters. One of the more extensive defensive systems surrounds the key transportation hub of Tokmak, which sits about 12 to 15 miles south of the third Russian defensive line. While these defenses are indeed extensive, there is some doubt from Western intelligence experts that Russia has enough trained troops to sufficiently man these fortifications. Ukraine's plan is to probe these defenses all along the front, determine where they're the weakest, and push their armored brigades forward from there. Tokmak is a natural deep penetration target for any Ukrainian breakthrough. A successful capture of Tokmak will provide Ukraine with two advantages. First, it'll cut the main rail line that runs from there southwest to Melitopol and beyond to the Crimean Peninsula. That will only leave the Kirk Bridge into Crimea from mainland Russia as the sole source of supply and reinforcements for almost a third of the Russian defense forces in Ukraine. If Ukraine begins to advance beyond Tokmak, the Russian defenders may start cutting their losses and retreat. If that happens, the limited approaches to the bridge will become a highly congested choke point. More importantly, capturing Tokmak would mean that the Ukraine forces will have breached the last line of Russian defenses south of the Dnipro River. There are additional unconnected trench and strongpoint networks scattered across the rest of the Zaporizhia Oblast, as well as significant series of defenses at the very northern edge of Crimea itself. But the primary east-west axis of Russian trenches will have been breached. From Tokmak, the Ukrainian army can continue 40 miles southwest to Melitopol, further boxing in the remaining Russian forces there, or head 100 miles east to Mariupol, one of the two key ports on the Sea of Azov still open to Russian forces. Berdyansk is the other key port, lying another 53 miles further east of Mariupol. Both ports have been under repeated bombardment since early May 2023 from Ukrainian long-range missiles, especially the newly arrived Storm Shadow. These attacks have reduced the effectiveness of these ports as loading and supply facilities. As Ukrainian forces edge closer to these two main ports, the Ukrainian artillery will also play a role in denying access to Russian ships. At some point, the remaining Russian forces will have to decide whether to retreat east to the oblasts of Donetsk or Luhansk, or to turn southwest and head for the Crimean Peninsula. By the time Ukrainian artillery is within range of the ports, about 130 to 150 miles away, no Russian ships will be able to supply troops safely. But will Ukraine be able to break through the multiple layers of Russian defenses? Will they be able to neutralize Russia's superiority in ground attack aircraft? Will Ukraine take these cities before they run out of armored brigades, artillery shells, and rockets? Available Ukrainian Resources
Multiple Western sources report that, according to their best estimates, Ukraine has between 10 and 12 armored combat brigades held in reserve until Ukrainian leadership has determined where the weakest point in the Russian defenses are. When that decision's been made, they'll commit elements from this massive reserve and punch a hole into the less defended rear areas. How large is this reserve force? A Ukrainian tank battalion normally has around 500 combat soldiers or more, with 31 tanks and an equivalent number of armored infantry vehicles. An armored infantry battalion would have about the same number. There'd be additional vehicles for carrying engineers, air defense units, logistics and support troops, as well as more standard infantry and replacement troops. An armored brigade would likely consist of three tank battalions and two mechanized infantry battalions. In total, then, an armored brigade is going to have around 250 to 300 armored vehicles, a little less than half of which would be tanks, and as many as 4,000 troops. There are Western estimates that the Ukrainians have gathered from 7 to 12 armored brigades. Some may only have Ukrainian or captured Russian equipment, while others will have a mix of Western-provided vehicles, which currently include Leopard tanks and Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicles, or IFVs. When we see two or three of those brigades, around 500 to 750 armored vehicles, focused on a narrow front, it'll then be possible to say that the main attack has probably started and that's where Ukraine is hoping to break through. But even then, we have to be careful. The Ukrainian general staff will want to keep the Russians guessing about the location of the main attack for as long as possible, and they won't be too bothered and will probably welcome social media bloggers getting it wrong. If the West provides everything the Ukrainian armed forces need, especially long-range precision weapons like the U.S. Attackums, then some analysts anticipate that Ukraine can recapture Crimea, taking the peninsula and denying Russia's Black Sea Fleet their anchorage in Sevastopol would clearly be one of Ukraine's primary goals of the offensive. If the UAF can get to within 150 miles of Sevastopol and the smaller ports of Saki and Zankoy, their long-range artillery and storm shadow missiles would make using those ports impossible for the Russian Navy. By forcing the Russian missile-armed ships further away from Crimea, Ukraine will be better able to defend against the numerous missile attacks Russia has been lobbing at Ukrainian population centers, while giving their air defense systems more time to intercept missiles aimed at cities like Kyiv and Odessa. The overall aim of the offensive, which has been stated many times by Ukrainian President Zelensky, is to liberate the illegally occupied areas based on our constitutionally defined legitimate borders, which are recognized internationally. Though it may be a tall order to recapture all the occupied territory, it's hoped that losing Crimea and a significant portion of the territory in the south and east of the country might convince the majority of Russia, if not Putin himself, that their continued aggression is meaningless. Can the counteroffensive succeed? One of the most significant indicators of whether the Ukrainian counteroffensive can succeed is the level of casualties the Russian army will sustain. According to a Ukrainian reporter for the Kyiv Post, Russia's military has already reached the point where more than 50% of their armed forces have been killed or wounded and unable to continue their service. When a unit reaches that 50% loss status, they're considered combat ineffective. To have the entire Russian army considered combat ineffective is a horrifying aspect for Russian commanders to deal with. The same report announced that in the 10 days of the initial phase of the counteroffensive, Russia has lost an additional 7,390 troops killed and an additional 15 to 22,000 wounded. That's a staggering number of casualties in just 10 days. These losses are also before the vast majority of Ukrainian armored brigades have even been committed to the offensive. The ratio of wounded to dead soldiers reflects how badly Russia cares for its wounded troops. The ratio is far worse, meaning more wounded troops die after being wounded than, for example, the U.S. rate during World War II, which was four surviving soldiers for every one that died in action. In Vietnam, a 5 to 1 ratio, and much worse than U.S. fighting in Iraq, 10 surviving soldiers for every soldier killed. By comparison, Ukraine's rate has been estimated to be 10 to 1 or better. Much of Ukraine's success can be attributed to having a more advanced medical system than Russia, as well as many more volunteers helping out with Ukraine's wounded soldiers. An aggregate of Ukrainian, Western intelligence, and Russian military bloggers have also reported that as of June 14th, Ukraine may have destroyed as many as 80 Russian tanks and 140 armored vehicles, along with more than 240 artillery and rocket systems in that same 10-day stretch. The Ukrainian general staff reported on June 11th that Russia has lost 17 tanks and 24 armored personnel vehicles in just a single day of the offensive. These numbers, even if a little on the optimistic side, point to a disastrous overall Russian loss that won't be sustained over the course of the continued offensive. We must ask, what are Ukraine's overall aims of their offensive? 
if it's to retake all of Ukraine back to its pre-2014 borders before Russia made its first incursions, then that might take some time, but it's certainly doable. It's even more possible when additional U.S. and Western forces arrive in the country. Ukraine is awaiting 31 promised U.S. Abrams tanks, enough for a tank battalion, and up to 100 F-16s from both NATO countries and possibly from Australia as well. Tank crews and pilots are already being trained on these new weapons, but it'll take time to get this equipment into Ukraine, along with the repair and support logistics needed to keep them maintained and serviced. British Challenger 2 tanks are also on their way. However, if it comes to Ukraine convincing Putin to halt his aggressive foreign policy and de-escalate this militaristic approach to his neighbors, many analysts see that it's never going to happen. Maxim Samurukov, a fellow at the Carnegie Russia Eurasian Center, wrote in June for Foreign Policy that the war has allowed Putin to work toward his ideal vision of Russia, helped by numerous Asian-directed transport and energy links to a society less reliant on the U.S. dollar. The share of Russian exports paid in U.S. dollars fell from 90% prior to the invasion to less than 50% in December 2022. Of course, that drop-off is mostly due to the sanctions placed on Russia by the U.S. and the EU, sanctions that have crippled Russia's economy. But as long as Putin and his oligarchs, who held the real power in the country, don't feel the effects of the sanctions too much, and as long as Putin can shield the residents of Moscow and St. Petersburg from the direct effects of the war, especially the mobilization of conscripts, he'll feel safe in the coming war. He's made every effort to force the poorer and less urban areas of Russia to bear the brunt of the draft. According to an October 2022 report by the investigative outlet iStories, in cooperation with the War Monitoring Group Conflict Intelligence Team, or CIT, 23 of the 26 regions with the highest proportion of recruits have incomes below the national average. The conscription has caused labor shortages in Siberia's Krasnoyarsk region, which reported the highest share of mobilized reservists nationwide at 5.5%. The Sevastopol region in southern Russia reported recruitment totals of 4%, while the republics of Buryatia and Dagestan, two of Russia's poorest regions that have already suffered the highest death tolls in Ukraine, recruited 3.7 and 2.6% respectively. By contrast, Moscow and St. Petersburg recruited well below 1% of their reservists, according to iStories and CIT calculations. So, this may be why the Ukrainian allied forces have begun sending drone attacks against Moscow. Some argue that the attacks have been targeted to the affluent suburbs of Rubloyovka, where many oligarchs, high government officials, and other elites maintain expensive homes and mansions. Public opinion for the invasion has reached as high as 90% in Russia's tightly scripted and heavily controlled mediascape. But attacks on Moscow's elite have brought some measure of acceptance from the average Muscovite who even see sanctions on oligarchs as a good thing. Ukraine's counteroffensive is indeed in place and making its first significant attacks. The majority of their armored brigades have yet to see combat, and when they do, their impact will be extensive. If Ukraine can continue to keep Russia's numerically superior air force away from ground attack roles by employing significant numbers of manned portable air defense systems or man pads, and if they can continue to eliminate Russian artillery with accurate counter-battery fire, then there is every indication that Ukraine can retake significant portions of their country, including Crimea. Continued probing attacks over the course of the next few weeks, until the first weeks of July, will determine how soon Ukraine can direct where the hammer will fall. And when that hammer does fall, the morale of the Russian army, heavily made up of conscripts with little training and without the motivation to die in a foreign land for Putin's folly, may break. When Ukrainian armored brigades begin roaming unchallenged through the majority of the Zaporizhia and Donetsk oblasts, the defeat of the invasion may finally be at hand. Now counterattack boredom, and go check out Ukraine's plan to move the war inside Russia, or click this other video instead.